Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. Paul Delaney has been a professor of physics and astronomy at York University since 1986. He is the coordinator of the Campus Astronomical Observatory and the director of the Division of Natural Science. From 1995 to 2001, he was the chair of Access York and was again its acting chair from 2009 through 2010. He is a passionate educator and delights in discussing the wonders of the universe with people of all ages. So please help me in welcoming Professor Paul Delaney. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so as you can see by the, the title, the Kepler mission and the promise of new worlds. In fact, it'll be much more than Kepler. There will be, uh, towards the end of the presentation, a significant mm, exploit, if you will, into the other missions that are currently underway, both uh, above the Earth's surface as well as the various telescopic endeavors to try and locate exoplanets, if you will, the, the hunt for Earth too. There has been a considerable amount of information in the media recently, courtesy of a tiny little object called Gliese uh, 581G, and we'll certainly touch on that later on. But in many ways, the hunt for Earth 2 is nearing, I think, completion. I have often said, especially to my class, that within the next five years, I would seriously expect us to have located another terrestrially, um, or, um, well, a terrestrially oriented planet. That is, not necessarily life, but an object which is comparable in size to the Earth with an atmosphere which will be supportive of life, but not necessarily containing life on that planetary body. So stay tuned, it's coming. Okay, here's the ad first. Sorry about this. Uh, if you've not visited York University's observatory, I certainly do encourage you to do so. There are several flyers floating around the place which give you a bit of a heads up about what we do. Every Wednesday night, for example, uh, throughout the year, we have our public viewing sessions whereby you can drop in, check out our telescopes, uh, ask for uh, various objects to be viewed and so on, talk to my staff, basically have a darn good time looking through the campus observatory. Yes, here in Toronto, it's a very bright light polluted environment. That's sad. However, if you select your objects carefully, there is no doubt that you can still have a terrific time looking through the telescope. 40 centimeter and 60 centimeter telescopes at your disposal. Normally, we just use the 40 centimeter uh, every Wednesday evening, but certainly uh, requests can come and we can fire up the 60. If you can't make it on a Wednesday night, then I certainly do suggest that you drop in on our online public viewing session, which is every Monday night. Now, at this time of the year, dark, early, and so on, we can observe from 7.30 through till 9.30 on both the Monday and the Wednesdays. The Monday night, though, is uh, you know your web browser's time. So you can sit back in the comfort, the warmth of your living room and uh, see what we are seeing through the Campus Observatory and through the chat room. You can chat with my staff, ask questions, and again, you can actually uh, you know make requests. You can also listen to us now. There is a program called Live from York U on astronomy.fm. It's a 24-hour internet radio radio station, which gives you uh, just about anything and everything in the astronomy and space science realm. And on Monday evenings, from now through the end of March, 8 till 9, you can listen to us as well. So you can certainly get your fill of astronomy through York University. And that's our two telescopes. Okay, some of the things that you will be able to find at the observatory if you are with us. Let's see whether or not I can make this work. Now, come on, it's my laptop. You should be able to do it. Oh, come on, please be nice. All right, well, it's thinking about that. As long as it doesn't hang, it'll be fine. One of the things that you always want to know is what happens when you go to bed. The night sky is full of wonderful activities. And while Kepler and the other observatories around the world and the observatories in Earth orbit are trying to dissect absolutely everything that we can see, you and I can still enjoy the wonders of the night sky just by looking up. Uh, and not looking at this slide, obviously. We have an all-sky camera. Basically, it's a fisheye view of the entire night sky, and it gives you the opportunity to see the changes of the constellations, the fact that we are indeed 
indeed uh, rotating about a common point in the sky, that there are satellites, that there are meteors, all of those wonderful things that if you're inside, you can't see, but you need to be outside. So every clear night, our all-sky camera looks up and gives us a sense of wonder. It talks to us about the reality of the night sky. Certainly my students don't necessarily appreciate the fact that everything rises in the east and sets in the west, that there is a series of natural laws that are followed night after night after night. And of course, if the moon is up, that's great. You can see it moving across the sky. Obviously, we're not going to succeed in seeing that on this image. So, yeah, we'll go past that. Oh, sigh. Um, but I encourage you all to go out and look. There are something like 200 billion stars, give or take, in the Milky Way galaxy. For the longest time, humans believed that there were other planets around those stars. But it was nothing more than a belief. Certainly science, astronomy, had tried desperately to find evidence of other planets. But until literally the last two to three decades, that search had been entirely fruitless. If you will, up until 1995, the only planets that were known to exist categorically were the planets in our solar system. Now, in 1995, we had nine. Yeah, today, we have eight. And that's a whole other story which you might like to talk about, Pluto being demoted from the planetary club. But the point is that our solar system was the only place where planets existed. If you'd asked any astronomer, I would argue, in the last 100 years... Were there planets around other stars? I think they would have said yes. But to be able to understand how to look for other planets, you really do need to have a good grasp of what's in our own backyard. What is in our solar system? Yes, there are planets, but there's a lot more than planets hanging out in our solar system. Satellites like our moon, in fact, there are hundreds of satellites orbiting the other planets in our solar system. Our minor planets or asteroids in the Kuiper belt, the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, the comets, short period, long period, those objects which one of these days are going to slam into the Earth and cause all sorts of grief. There is no shortage of material in our solar system. How did it evolve? How did it get here? What was the processes involved four and a half billion years ago that generated the activity that we see in our solar system today? You can't get those answers entirely just by looking up. You can't get those answers entirely by digging into our own planetary surface. I would argue that one of the best ways to round out our understanding of our planetary environment and therefore planetary environments anywhere else is to go step foot on another object. And that's what we did, of course, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. We went to the moon, our nearest neighbor in space. Now, this is actually an image taken by the Galileo spacecraft as it was leaving the vicinity of Earth en route to Jupiter back in the late 1980s. In fact, 1989, uh, Galileo went into orbit around Jupiter in 1995 and a very successful mission there for about eight years. The first thing that you should see as you look back towards the Earth-Moon system is two very distinctly different worlds. Their appearances, just from this one image alone, show you that there are startling differences between the two objects. The Earth is sort of bluey white marble, obviously with significant amounts of reflectivity, clouds, ice, water, land masses, the whole nine yards. Beautiful little spot. And then when you look up at the Moon, it's considerably different. In fact, it is quite dark, quite barren, and one of the driest places in the universe, let alone our solar system. That, of course, has been a rather interesting debate on its own for the last year. We thought we understood the moon quite well. When we went to the moon with the Apollo missions back in the late 60s, early 70s, we sent 12 people to the surface. We picked up, yeah, give or take a bit, a couple of hundred kilograms of moon rock brought all that material back here, left a series of science experiments on the moon to continue our uh, scientific endeavors. But after the Apollo landings, we thought we knew pretty well what the moon was all about. And from the point of view of moisture, we were quite convinced it was really, really dry. Well, we left the moon for about 30 years, even from a robotic perspective. But over the last 10 years, and particularly over the last five, there's been a resurgence in interest about the moon. Now, that was arguably a result of George Bush's declaration in 2005 for NASA and the U.S. to go back to the moon by 2020, which won't happen. But the last five years have certainly generated a renewed interest in the moon. And there's a lot of stuff 
that we really didn't quite have right, courtesy of Apollo. One of those question marks was how wet, how moist was the moon? And it was about this time last year that NASA slammed a uh, Centaur rocket booster into the moon and followed it in with a spacecraft laden with instruments, a mission called LCROSS, and determined that the moon wasn't quite as dry as we first thought, that there really are ice deposits at the base of craters. It's not very wet. When you compare it to, say, the Sahara Desert or any desert-like uh, area on the surface of the Earth, certainly the moon is quite dry. It's only about, roughly speaking, twice the moisture content of the Sahara Desert. But that is still considerably more than we thought from 30 to 40 years ago. Science is something that requires us to continually ask and seek information. We don't just sit back and assume that the information we have at hand is, in fact, the entire story. And when it comes to looking for exoplanets, there is little doubt that that story is changing dramatically almost month by month. Now, these are the planets that are in our solar system. Roughly speaking, we're talking about four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four Jovian worlds, or gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you can see some of the basic statistics there on the slide in front of you. And for those of you who are still a little bit concerned and worried and annoyed about Pluto, as you can see there, that's the information on the left, which if you read through it carefully, certainly signal Pluto to be unique as far as the objects in our solar system. So perhaps not so much of a surprise that in 2006, the International Astronomical Union effectively demoted Pluto out of the planetary club. So we went from nine planets to eight. If you're worried also that uh, Pluto has suddenly gone away, it sort of you know, left the planetary system uh, in disgust, no, it's still there. Shortly after the IAU gave its announcement in 2006, you might recall that uh, NASA had launched a spacecraft by the name of New Horizons to head out to Pluto and uh, make observations. I'll never forget reading a news media release where a reporter asked NASA whether or not they were going to turn off the probe because Pluto was no longer considered a planet. Oh, sigh. Any news reporters amongst us? At any rate, these are the sorts of planets that we were hoping we would be able to find around other worlds. But by definition, planets are small. They are non-luminous objects. Stars, of course, are large, big, and bright. Finding planets, directly or indirectly, was always considered a challenge. Nonetheless, by the mid-1990s, the challenges, basically technological challenges, had been met. And as of today, close to 500 planets are known to exist around stars in our galaxy. Now that number is going to change very dramatically. In January, the international, no, not the international, the American Astronomical Society will have its winter meeting. At that meeting, the scientists who are associated with the Kepler mission will report a significant amount of, uh, a significant number of results from the amount of data they have been picking up over the last 18 months. While nobody will say exactly, it will not surprise me if that number of 500 that I just mentioned to you goes up to around about 750 at the end of January, and a year after that, watch it double. So we're on the verge of, uh, literally, a population explosion of planets. So how do we get to this point? Well, as I said, back in 1995, the number of planets that were known to exist was only the planets in our solar system, nine at that point in time. That's not to say that people hadn't been striving desperately to find planets prior to that. In fact, the Canadian connection, back in the 1970s, uh, Walker and Campbell, two astronomers from uh, the University of Victoria and the University of British Columbia, had gotten together and conceived a notion whereby, using the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope on uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, they thought they would be able to detect the signature of extrasolar planets, exoplanets. It was a bold idea. It was certainly one that received mm, a great deal of skepticism from the uh, scientific community, basically because it was a brand new idea and it was bordering right on the edge of technological capability. But nonetheless, Walker and Campbell persisted. And they made a series of observations in the late 1970s and early 1980s. 
History will record that the paper that you see there that was published in 1988, that that paper suggested that the 16 target stars that they observed did not have within the level of detectability, their threshold of detectability, did not have any exoplanets. It was the first, well, it was just about the first paper that was ever ever uh, cited in the uh, peer-reviewed literature saying that we were searching, this is the way we were going to search for exoplanets, we're looking at these 16 stars, and that we'd come up short. Unfortunately, at that point in time, funding for the project literally disappeared. Yeah, lots of politics, which is really a shame, because the technique that they found, what we call the radial velocity or wobble technique, is today by far the most successful technique in finding exoplanets. Worse still, of the 16 stars that they observed, two have since had planets found around them. So they had a sample set of stars that could have produced the first exoplanets in the early 1980s. And it could have been, if you will, on our telescope. Didn't quite happen. It was a real shame. Instead, it was left till 1995 when Mayor and Quilo, and I'm probably not pronouncing that properly, found the first exoplanet around a sun-like star, 51 Pegasus b. Now, a bit of note on nomenclature here. Stars have got terrific names like 51 Peg, and you're going to see things like HD 123456 and so on. There's just too many stars for us to give names. So invariably, you will see the name of a star as a catalog number. The first planet that is found around that star has got the lowercase letter b, and then the second planet is c and d and so on. So when you see uh, star b, star c, star d, those represent the first, second, and third planets found, not necessarily in their order of distance from the stars. So it was 1995, 51 Peg b was the first planet to be found around an uh, around a sun-like star, a star very similar to our own sun. As I said, the technique that they used was exactly the same as Campbell and Walker. The only difference, they had sort of like 10 to 15 years more technology. So let's talk about the radial velocity technique, just to keep us all on the same page. When a planet orbits around a star, to a first approximation, the planet is orbiting around the center of the star, but it's only an approximation. In reality, when two objects are gravitationally bound together, like a planet and a star, they are actually orbiting what we call their common center of mass. What that means is that the center of mass of that combined system is offset from the center of a star. The planet orbits around that center, but because it's fairly close to the star's center, from an outsider's perspective, first approximation, it looks like the planet is orbiting around the star. But as I said, it's really orbiting around the common center of mass. From the star's perspective, the center of the star, of course, is orbiting around the center of mass. And while that is a short distance, it is nonetheless a very important offset. Because what it means is that as the planet is orbiting around the star, the star itself is moving around that center of mass and almost looks like a bowl of jello wobbling from side to side. So as you can see from the diagram, the star would effectively be in orbit around that common center of mass. And from the perspective of the Earth, off to the right-hand side, you would see the star sort of wobble towards you, then wobble away, and then wobble in front, and then wobble to the side. It would, it would engage in this small motion. And that motion, while not detectable in all likelihood, to a visual observer, so you've got your eye stuck to the eyepiece of the telescope and you're looking at this star for hours, days, weeks, or months on end and you go, well, I don't see anything. You probably don't. But if you now take the signature of that starlight, break it up into its fundamental components, its spectrum, you will in fact detect 
the variation of the star's velocity as it's first coming towards you and then moving away from you, that Doppler variation, you will see that reflected, exhibited by the spectral lines of the star. The spectral lines will move towards the blue end of the spectrum as the star wobbles towards you. You will see those spectral lines move towards the red end of the spectrum as the star wobbles away from you. And as the planet orbits around the star, inducing this motion of the star moving about the common center of mass, that cycle will be repeated based upon the orbital period of the planet. So if you've got a planet in orbit every 10 days, it takes 10 days to spin once around the star, then the star will wobble around the center of mass in that same frequency, in that same period. Thus, if you're carefully monitoring the spectrum of the star, you see this blue to red to blue to red shift of the spectrum of the star changing every 10 days, cyclically. It is that cyclic signature that we are looking for with the radial velocity or the wobble technique. It's what Walker and Campbell were looking for. The trick, however, is that stars don't wobble very quickly. They literally wobble at speeds of only a few meters per second. So if you walk from one side of this room to the other in, say, three or four seconds, that's about the speed with which a star will wobble about its center of mass requires a very sensitive spectrograph to be able to make that detection. And that's where Campbell and Walker were in difficulty. In the late 70s, early 80s, while the technology was just available, our level of um, the, the, the detectability threshold was up around 100 meters a second. We were pushing it down, but the sensitivity of the spectroscopic method was about 100 meters per second. We needed to be down in the tens of meters per second, hence why the detection that Walker and Campbell were looking for wasn't seen. But by 1995, we were down in the tens of meters per second, and today we're down around about one meter per second. With that level of sensitivity, we are finding more and more. So this is the technique which you will hear a lot about both with me tonight as well as any newspaper, or any science article you pick up. The radial velocity or the stellar wobble technique. You are inferring the existence of an exoplanet because of its influence, its gravitational influence on the parent star and the parent star's wobble about the common center of mass. Well, as of this morning, I checked, 494 confirmed exoplanets in existence. So from 1995 to today, barely 15 years, we have found just under 500 planets. Watch that number, because every time I give a talk, it changes. This is the slide which always gets amended every time I give this presentation. And by the end of January, I would care to bet that that number is up around 750. The graph that you see underneath is hardly a complete graph. It just gives you a bit of a sense of the types of planets we are finding. Now, these are all done with ground-based facilities. The biggest surprise to us as we started finding exoplanets is that they had very little resemblance to the planets in our solar system. And worse still, the configuration of planets around those stars had no resemblance to our solar system. In our solar system, the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, all hang out close to our sun. They sit in the warmth, the glow of the inner solar system. And then the gas giants, the Jovian worlds, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, much larger objects are hanging out in the far other reaches of the solar system, the cold expanse, if you will, of the solar system. When we started finding planets around out of the stars, we had naively assumed that the distribution of those planets would look eh, something like our own solar system. Not. When we found the planets around other stars, we were finding planets that were considerably larger than Jupiter, and they were in tight orbits around their parent stars. Orbital periods that were measured in days. Now, put it in perspective. Mercury, the closest planet to our sun, has an orbital period of 88 days, once around the sun in just under three months. 
the first exoplanets we were finding were several times more massive than Jupiter in orbital periods 3, 4, 5, 10 days. Really quite a surprise. Now in hindsight, it shouldn't have been a surprise to us because the bigger the planet, the closer into its orbit, the more dramatic is its impact on its parent star and the greater is the wobble that it will induce. So finding hot Jupiters in tight orbits had to have been the first types of planets we would find because they would have the brightest, uh, most easily detected signature spectroscopically. It's what we call a selection effect. It doesn't mean that all of the planets out there are going to be hot Jupiters, but they will be the first ones found because of their significant influence on the center of mass of that system and therefore the, the star which is wobbling around it. Nonetheless, it was a little bit disconcerting because it sort of carried on for several hundred planets, okay? And we're going, my gosh, what happened to the notion of the evolution of our solar system, whereby we thought we knew that the terrestrial planets would work their way into the inner solar system, that the gas giants would be further out, and here we were finding planetary systems that were in complete reverse. Well, fortunately, as we've gotten better with our observations, so too are we beginning to find planets that are more similar to the planets in our solar system. And we now have got planetary systems that are multiple planets, five, six, seven planets, and their, their distribution is beginning to look a little more like our own solar system. The sheer fact that there is this great range of planetary distributions suggests, at least to me and to certainly many others, that planets are indeed quite a common feature around other stars. As I said, back to 1995, no other planets out there. And then we would find one, and then two, and then three, and people were going, oh gosh, maybe planets are not very common. But today, the speed with which we are finding planets, the acceleration which is happening, courtesy of the improved technology to find exoplanets, is certainly signaling that planets are indeed very common. And we're looking primarily at sun-like stars or cooler. And that's, that's an important point that we'll get to in just a second. Why do we start looking with sun-like planets? Oh, sorry, around sun-like stars? Well, the short answer is we're looking for life. If we want to find life as we understand it, and that's the only thing that we really can search for at the moment, carbon-based life, that life depends intimately on the existence of water. If you want to have water on a planetary surface, then you've got to f locate that planet in what we call the habitable zone around the parent star. And that is a region where the temperature from the star is such that on the planetary surface, water can exist in at least a liquid form and probably solid, liquid, and gas. That habitable zone is a very finite width around any, uh, around any star. The hotter the star, the further out the habitable zone will be. The cooler the star, the closer in will be the habitable zone. Now, of course, just because a planet is located in the habitable zone doesn't mean that life exists on it. Just because a planet exists in the habitable zone doesn't mean it has an atmosphere and an appropriate environment to allow water to exist on its surface. But if the planet is located in the habitable zone, you stand a chance then of having an atmosphere which will allow for the existence of liquid water and therefore the possibility of life. So the first stars that we start looking at are what we call G-type stars, stars very similar in age and temperature to our own sun. We've started looking at plan sorry, we've started looking at stars that are lower in mass than our sun. That means they're a little bit cooler. That means the habitable zone is closer in to the star. But that's okay. Those types of stars are much more common than our own sun. And so if we're trying to build up statistics, if we're trying to take a sample of stars and say, what is the likelihood that there are planets around any of these stars, then we need to build statistics. We need not just look at G-type stars. We need to start looking at K and M, the cooler stars, which are more common. And it gives us greater insight and greater confidence with our statistics and our commentary about how common planets might be.
So again, you will see a lot of searches being conducted at the moment for those smaller type stars. There's all sorts of other problems that we could talk about with respect to life on planets. Those smaller type stars are not necessarily as stable as our sun. If you're looking around a star which is considerably hotter than our sun, its lifespan is much shorter. You pick a star which is twice the mass of our own sun, for example, and its total length of life is approximately 10% that of our sun. Our sun, give or take a bit, will live for about 10 to 11 billion years. Don't panic, we're halfway. But if you go to a hotter star, that 10 to 11 billion years comes down to 1 billion years if you're, say, twice the mass of our own sun. So in that time frame, we do not believe life can evolve. When we look at the only sample we know about, our own planet, it took the better part of half to 1 billion years before anything began to evolve. And we're talking about phyloplankton and so on in the oceans. But it was several more billion years before we began to get multicellular complex life forms. Well, a star which is considerably hotter and therefore larger than our sun does not have that length of time to allow life to evolve. So we've started looking for exoplanets that are in orbits around stars that are somewhat similar to our own sun, and we're looking in the habitable zone of those stars. We're looking for Earth 2s there. Now, as I said, that, the radial velocity technique is by far the most successful. But you're not imaging a planet. You are detecting a signature that suggests a planetary existence. There's lots of complications to that, and you've got to be careful of what we call false positives. You don't want to race out to the media and say, I have found a planet, only to find it's sort of a dwarf star or it's a compact object that's nothing like a planet. So you've got to be careful. Another technique, though, which was realized to be a promising technique is what we call the transit technique. This relies on the planet sliding in front of the star as seen from our perspective here on Earth. Again, as our technology has improved, the level of detectability of these types of passages, these types of transit, has improved considerably. If a planet slides in front of a star, it blocks a little bit of that light. And so as we're sitting here on the Earth looking at the starlight, the planet blocks some of that light and we see a dip in the photometric light curve. And you can see those dips there on the slide. The bigger the planet, the bigger the dip. The closer the planet is to the star, the bigger the dip. So there's all sorts of variabilities in the parameters. But the bottom line to it is that if a planet slides in front of the star from our point of view, it will block starlight. And we should be able to detect that. The snag, of course, is that you've got to have the planetary orbit in our line of sight's plane. Now, there is nothing to say that the orbit of a planet around another star is going to conveniently line itself up such that, from our perspective, the planet will slide in front of the star. A planetary orbit can be in any inc at any inclination, at any orientation, from our perspective. And unless that planetary orbit is in the plane of our line of sight, you will not see a transit. If you do the arithmetic, the chances are about, you know, if you take a random set of stars of, say, 100 stars, one or two of them should have a star, sorry, should have a planet in orbit around that star that it's in our line of sight. Well, how do you uh, beat statistics? You get a lot of stars. If you observe a 1,000 stars, then you're up to, say, 10 of, those plan 10 of those stars having planets with orbits in our line of sight. 10,000 stars, 100,000 stars, you get the drift. You can certainly work your way up to getting some good results if you can look at enough stars. Well, from the surface of the Earth, that means a lot of observers. And fortunately, the transit technique is now within the realm, within the reach of amateur astronomers. In fact, my fourth year class at York regularly goes and proves that even in Toronto with a 60 centimeter telescope, you can observe the transit of exoplanets in front of stars. It is, I won't say an easy observation, you do have to be careful, but nonetheless, it is certainly doable. The, the drop of light is about 1%. 
mightn't sound much, but it's more than enough for a careful observer. And so 60 centimeter telescopes in bright city environments means that thousands of amateur astronomers worldwide are looking for exoplanets. So we've gone from 1995 planets in our solar system to the backyard astronomer with their small telescope looking with success for exoplanets around stars. So we've really come a long way. So the transit technique, if you're patient and you've got statistics on your side, is a very viable technique for finding exoplanets. And even better, this time round, you can actually measure the diameter of those planets because you can actually get that information out of the light curve. You can get a better handle on the mass because you know the angle of inclination. That's one of the biggest problems with the wobble technique. You still don't know anything about the angle of inclination of that planetary orbit that introduces a huge, what we call sine theta variability in the mass determination that disappears with the transit technique. So the more planets we can find with the transit technique, the greater is our understanding of their planetary characteristics. So the transit technique is terrific if you can find the planet doing the right thing. Well, enter Kepler. You were beginning to worry that I wasn't going to get there, right? So in the 1990s, many astronomers suggested to NASA that this was the way to go. If we can put a telescope in Earth orbit or at least above the Earth's atmosphere, we should be able to monitor literally 100,000 stars or more simultaneously looking for exoplanetary transits. It took until the early 2000s for NASA and the funding lines to sort of congeal and allow the project to go forward. But by 2009, as you can see, the launch actually occurred. The Kepler spacecraft is dedicated to looking for exoplanets. It has, as you can see there, 42 charge coupled devices, 42 electronic cameras that are aimed at an area of the Milky Way galaxy in the constellation of Cygnus, looking along the arm of our galaxy, looking at those 100,000 stars 24-7, 365. And if all goes well, it'll do that for four years. It's a huge amount of data. This, the, the, the data that is flooding back from Kepler is just absolutely stunning. We're talking about you know basically snapping an image once a minute every single minute of every single year, and it's been up in orbit now for about a year and a half, and we're anticipating it living for at least four years or longer. Not only are we getting planetary data, by the way, we're getting some terrific information about stars. I mean, this is a wildly successful mission from any astronomical perspective. We are able to monitor the variability of those stars. Stars are not nearly as stable and static as you might think. We're looking for planetary transits. You name it, we're looking for it from this very rich data set as the telescope looks continuously at the area of sky, unimpeded by the atmosphere of the Earth, unimpeded by light pollution. It just stares continuously at this area of the Milky Way galaxy. The first 43 days of data that have come back suggests to us that of order 700 interesting objects exist and that at least 300 of them are planetary in nature. 43 days. So you can imagine the data set that we now have after a year and a half. It's not public data yet. It's, it's still in the hands of the Kepler team. It will become public, but at the moment it is still being analyzed by the Kepler team. And as I said, at the end of January, we'll see a significant amount of that data. Uh, the area of sky, for those of you who are familiar with the night sky, you can see it very clearly here in uh, the uh, northern hemisphere in the height of summer. It's in the border of the Cygnus Lyra region. So it passes literally straight overhead here in Toronto. This was the first light image from April of 2009. You can see the 42 CCDs lined up there. The quality of the data was everything that we had anticipated. The ability for the telescope to stay on station, looking at the, the patch of the Milky Way galaxy, everything that we had wanted. So one of the first things we did, of course, was to look at a known exoplanet. So we looked at a star that we knew had a transiting planet, and that's it there on the left. You can see its terrific name. Uh, but the, the important point here is to look at the noise of the data. You can see the solid line 
indicating the dip, the change in intensity that arises as the planet slides across in front of the star. But it's a noisy, noisy signal. You look on the right and you see that same star with the data from Kepler. And the, what we call signal to noise is immeasurably improved. But even better, look at the lower right hand image. Put on your three dimensional thinking caps here. You've got a planet orbiting around the star. Now, if you think for just a moment about the moon orbiting around the Earth, everybody will remember that the moon changes its phase as it moves around the Earth. That is to say, the geometry of the moon, the Earth, and the sun is such that sometimes we see a quarter moon, sometimes we see a half moon, sometimes a full moon, and sometimes, of course, we don't see a moon at all. Okay? It goes through a series of phases on a one-month cycle. Well, planets orbiting around a star do exactly the same thing. From our perspective here on Earth, in theory, you have got the planet coming towards you, exhibiting basically a full phase. But as it swings around into our line of sight, the amount of that planet that we are able to see begins to change. The amount of the planet that is being illuminated by its parent star, from our perspective, begins to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's what you see here with the Kepler data. As the planet began to move into our direct line of sight and slide across the star's face from our perspective, so too was Kepler able to detect the slight changes associated with the phasing attitude of the planet. Now, it was something that we had hoped to be able to see. In other words, the sensitivity of the CCD cameras was everything we had wanted it to be, and we were able to detect very, very subtle changes in light, light intensity from the planet. So with this, in the first couple of months of commissioning, everybody began to hold their breath. Certainly as of, well, I've got August here, but it hasn't changed much in the last three months. At this point in time, we still have this expectation of hundreds of planets to be released to us at the end of January. There are follow-up observations from telescopes all around the planet that are uh, trying to confirm the observations that Kepler is making to make sure that we're not looking, say, for example, at a variable star or some other phenomena that would suggest, no, it's not a planet. There are, however, a number of planets that have been released. And again, we use terrific nomenclature, Kepler 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. These are the planets which Kepler has found that we didn't know existed around these stars before. And you can see the light curves being exhibited there. Some planets are larger than others. Some are smaller than others. All of the planets are, roughly speaking, sun-like stars. Some of the characteristics... I draw your attention to the size of Earth on the far right-hand side. None of these planets you could remotely consider as Earth-2. These are all hot Jupiters. You can see the masses compared to Jupiter running across the bottom of the slide. You can see the size, the radius of the planet with respect to the Earth sort of in the middle. None of these are objects that you and I would ever want to try and set foot upon. These are not terrestrial planets. Nonetheless, they are the first planets that Kepler has successfully identified. Just to give you a real sense of the temperature here, okay, planets in our solar system towards the bottom, including where Earth is, where liquid water can exist on our surface, and then you can see the first planets that Kepler has found. They're all extremely hot, okay, and very massive objects by and large. So nothing terribly exciting here, nothing terribly surprising. We're seeing hot Jupiters all over our galaxy. Not surprising that the first few planets that Kepler found, same sort of thing. The bigger they are, the easier they are to find. And they're all in very tight orbits, periods that are literally only a few days. The latest one that Kepler released quite recently from August was the Kepler 9. And this one was really interesting because, as you can see on the slide, two, if not three, planets are found to be orbiting with orbital planes in our line of sight. That's the first time we've found a multiple planetary system with planetary orbits in our line of sight. So the fact that we are finding such variation in planetary configurations to me is signaling that planets really are very common, that they are abounding. 
In fact, if we take the number of planets we've found around the stars and look at it from a fractional point of view of the total number of stars we've looked at, we're getting up close to 10%. So for every 10 stars, one of them we have managed to detect planets around them. Well, if that holds true for 200 billion stars in our galaxy, there's an awful lot of planets out there. Okay, now, you, you do have to be careful. Everything that we, we are saying here, you, know, you can't just automatically assume that we find a planet, we find a planet in a planetary system, and therefore we're going to find the sorts of conditions that we were expecting. That is to say, our planetary evolutionary theory with respect to terrestrial planets and gas giants, we've not seen replicated yet. Does that mean that something special or unusual happened to our planetary environment when we were forming four and a half, five billion years ago? Astronomers are very reluctant to say that we are special in any way, shape, or form. So trying to better understand the differing mechanisms upon which planetary formation can take place is very, very important. And there's been a, a terrific amount of work done over the last three, four, five years trying to simulate a variety of differing planetary system configurations and the way those planets came into existence. You'll see a lot more of that. It certainly is suggestive that there are many, many differing possibilities out there of which our planetary formation was but one. Where is this going to take us? Well, one of the nice things about the improvement in technology is the ability for us to begin to analyze the atmospheres of other planets. We've got our planet, well, we've got a planet that we can observe, and that planetary system includes light reflected from the planet and, of course, light from the star. If you wait for the planet to slip behind and out of your field of view, you get a nice spectrum of the star. With modern computer techniques, you subtract those light signatures and you end up with the planetary signature itself. And that means we begin to probe the atmosphere. We begin to look for biomarkers. We begin to look for the trace elements that might suggest life is present on those, star uh, sorry, on those planets. And so there is a big push now to improve our resolving capability of the spectrum of planets around these exoplanetary systems. Very quickly, because I'm now running entirely over time, just to give you a bit of a sense of the other missions that are out there, the other observing campaigns. The Kuro system is, oh sorry, the Kuro satellite is in orbit about the Earth and is doing a, a multitude of differing science uh, experiments, but one of them is looking for exoplanets, looking for the transiting signatures of exoplanets. The Kuro satellite has found several, including some very low mass objects. And I will just speed through these. You can ask me more questions about them uh, during the question period. So Kuro is one quite successful satellite. Another one is the HARPS instrument, which is sitting down in South America and Chile at the European Southern Observatory. HARP, as you can see, terrific acronyms. Astronomers love to create acronyms. But the uh, high accuracy of this instrument is what sets it apart from most other instruments on the planet. Remember I said that Campbell and Walker were unsuccessful in their detections of exoplanets because of a lack of resolution. That is certainly no longer the case and we're down to one meter per second and we're finding with these very very high resolution spectrographs we're finding multiple planetary signatures around a star suggesting Solar systems like our own are, in fact, you know, reasonably common out there, not just one planet around one star. This is the Galice 581 system, the one that has certainly generated a lot of interest over the last year, and particularly over the last month or two. You can see the planetary distribution there. Uh, the slide, the graphic there, shows the first four planets that were released. We've now found two more, and 581G, while it's not pictured there in the slide on the right, is exactly in the middle of the habitable zone. It's a rocky world. It is terrestrial. It's you know a little larger than Earth. 
It's the one that a lot of people are saying, gosh darn, this is, this is Earth 2. Well, I certainly wouldn't concur with that. This is a tidally locked planet. In other words, one side is facing the sun all the time, and therefore it'll be a little bit warm for water to stay in a liquid state. The other side of the planet is always looking away, and therefore it's a little chilly, so it's probably ice. The only area where life would stand a chance of existing, I'm not saying it's there, but the only place that it would stand a chance is along the Terminator. We know nothing about the atmosphere. We can tell you its diameter, we can tell you its mass, we can tell you its average surface temperature. That's all we can say. The fact that we've found a rocky world in the habitable zone is terrific news, but it's not Earth 2. You know, give or take a bit, 20 light years. It's an M dwarf. It's orbiting, it, G is orbiting every about mm, 20 days or thereabouts. Uh, what can I say? Uh, there are probably many other examples here. As I recall, and as I say, I am running out of time here. Let's see here. Yeah. Okay, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to stop at this point in time. I know you probably want me to carry on, but I probably would prefer to have uh, field some of your questions. In summation, while there are a huge number of planets that are out there, and that number is growing almost by the day, the hunt is on not just to find planets through the radial velocity technique, not just to find planets through... Uh, the transiting technique a la Kepler. There are many other techniques that are being brought to bear. And the nice thing is that they tend to complement each other. You don't find just a planet around the star with one technique. You can probably bring to bear two or three or four differing techniques and they give you differing physical parameter information. You are building up a repository of understanding. And the more we can understand how planets have formed around other stars, the better we can answer the question of how planetary evolution galaxy-wide has progressed. And if we get more insight into that question, then of course, how many terrestrial worlds, how many Earth 2s could potentially be out there? If you've got the real estate with Earth 2, then you have the opportunity to find life. And that is certainly, if you will, something like the Holy Grail. We're trying to get an understanding of these planetary systems so that we can realistically say, yes, there are 10 billion Earths out there, or there is 10 Earths. Getting a handle on that real estate is where a lot of this research is going, because we are all trying very hard to answer the question of, quote, are we alone? And on that note, I'll stop and field questions. Go for it. Okay, I, I have uh, one quick question and then a detailed one. The quick one is uh, the general rotation of the galaxy, does that make it more likely that the orbital plane will be aligned with us? No, the uh, formation of, of planetary systems really can be quite independent of the orbital plane of our galaxy. Certainly as our galaxy formed, stars, uh, well, the, the material from which stars formed did begin to condense into a fairly thick disk. However, Stars tend not to form by themselves. They form in, in clusters. I know the sun is by itself at the moment, but we suspect that wasn't the case when it formed. And the internal motions of those clusters can certainly change the orientation of what we call the, the solar nebula, the disks from which planets are forming. So there is unlikely to be any correlation between the orientation of those solar nebulae and the Milky Way's plane. Okay, a, a hot gas will have very broad spectral lines due to Doppler shifting in random directions. The surface of a star will be churning and the star will be spinning. How on earth do you separate the data? <laughs> uh, the short answer is it's a challenge. Um, if you remember that um, stars like our sun, of course, are what we call dwarf stars. And the thickness, if you will, of their spectral lines is actually not all that bad. When you get up to very large uh, stars uh, in, in the giant, then there is considerably broader lines 
uh, well, actually, considerably thinner lines that exist. So you, 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 you've, you've got to deal with those breadths. But if you've got enough movement of the planet around the star and therefore the star around its common center of mass, that width of the line actually sort of is a, is a static variable and its overall motion you can detect if it's enough. Now, if, if, if you've really got a very broad line, and it's only moving, say, one meter per second, you're right, we probably can't detect that. But not all of the lines are as broad as others because composition is another important characteristic. You know, if you don't have very much of a signature for that spectral line, its width is not going to be as high. And so if it becomes thinner, of course, that one meter per second becomes a whole lot easier to detect. So there is no doubt that spectroscopy is almost as much an art as it is a science, but we've gotten sufficiently good spectroscopically over the last 20 years that we are able to disentangle a lot of that information. There are hundreds of spectral lines, thousands of spectral lines, but some are much easier to work with than others. So it, it is a challenge, but, and it can be done. I have two quick questions. Forgive me if um, you've already covered the first one because I came late. Have we found anything at all at the nearest star, Alpha Centauri? No, at this point in time, uh, the 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 possibility of a planet there is slim. Now, I, I hasten to add. Remember, I said that the orbital period of a planet is what determines the wobble period, if you will. So, if, for example, you are looking at our solar system from outside, the planet Jupiter, which has the biggest influence on our star, takes twelve years to go once around our sun. So for me to say categorically there aren't planets around stars is actually a little bit foolish. What I can tell you is that around Alpha Centauri that are, there are no planets that are close in. If there are planets that are in orbital periods 5 to 10 years, we haven't been monitoring Alpha Centauri long enough yet to detect it with the radial velocity. We have not seen anything with the um, uh, transit technique, but that just means that the orbital plane is not in our line of sight. So if there is a planet in orbit that is Jupiter size or thereabouts at the same distance from its parent star as ours, then it's going to take us 12 years to detect one orbit around it, and therefore one wobble. And invariably, we will want to see that cycle repeated at least twice, if not three times, before we're really sure that what we're looking at is a planet in orbit. So that's 24 or 36 years. So that's the drawback of the radial velocity technique. The further out the planet is from the star, the longer you have to wait before you're actually going to be sure that you've got a planet. That's why Kepler's mission, by the way, is going to be three to four years. They've argued that if you're looking for an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone around a star similar to our sun, its orbital period is one year. You'll see it two, three, or four times in the life of Kepler, and that will be considered a categorical uh, observation. Okay, next question. Using our own asteroid field as an example, and the rate of increase in the sensitivity of our techniques, how long do you figure before we'll be able to see whether or not other systems have asteroid fields? Well, in fact, we know they have already, uh, but it's not through any of the techniques I've been talking about tonight, uh, by the what we call the infrared excess. When we look at other planetary systems, we can, if you will, measure the temperature profile in and around the star. And when you've got a very large asteroid belt, then there's a lot of material there that effectively raises the temperature. There's a lot of dust because the asteroids are colliding so much that puts a layer of dust in that area. So we are able to detect the existence of dust and gas clouds around stars. And we are beginning to say, okay, yep, there looks like there's an asteroid field. We can't tell you that there's say a million objects in there and we can't tell you anything about the size we can just tell you that there is a dust distribution which looking at our solar system suggests that there is an asteroid field finding them visually is a lot more challenging quick follow-up to that question um sorry <laughs> the people behind you might hang you but anyway <laughs> um does that technique also work for oort clouds uh it does but a little little harder because when you're out of the oort cloud you're so much further out and therefore the concentration of that signature is much lower. When you're in close to the, the star, if, if you will, the material sort of 
banks up on itself and the signature is much easier to detect. But in principle, yes, and we have seen extended dust clouds around forming stars. Uh, but whether or not we've got the level of um, sensitivity to say, yep, that's another or cloud, no, we, we can't say that to you. But we can tell you whether or not there is any level of infrared excess out to certain distances. And you know, as we get more telescopes in Earth orbit, looking in the infrared, we'll have a better handle on that sort of thing, particularly the James Webb Telescope when it launches about four years from now. Thank you. Marlis Tuck, I have two questions. How is it known how far away a star is to calculate the number of light years distance? I know about the redshift, and the only bit of geometry I can think of is to measure it at two positions where the uh, – at two times during the Earth's year to do that. How is that in the world done? Okay. Uh, you're, certainly the parallax method is what we call the most direct method. And so providing a star is within about a thousand light years of us, we can actually still measure enough of an angular shift of that star at 2.6 months apart in our orbit. So if we make an observation July 1st and January 1st, we can detect the apparent angular shift of that star courtesy of our motion and therefore get a handle on distance. But a thousand light years doesn't take us very far when you think that the Milky Way galaxy is, oh, give or take a bit, 100,000 light years across. But nonetheless, those direct observations are very useful. There are a whole series of what we call standard candles that are available to us. So for example, if I can use the example, if, if I had a 100 watt light bulb sitting right here, you could measure the, the flux that this bulb gives off at your distance. If I then sent you back another kilometer, you would measure that 100 watt light bulb again. It would be dimmer, but it's the same 100 watt light bulb. So the difference in the intensity that you detect in your two differing locations is directly a function of the distance. So the trick is to be able to look at a star and say, aha, I know what you are. You're a G-type star. You're doing this, this, and this, and therefore your total luminosity, the total amount of power that you're radiating is fill in the blank. Stars don't randomly generate a certain amount of intensity. If we plot, for example, temperature as a function of luminosity, uh, which is energy, uh, or power to be a little more specific, there is what we call a main sequence where 90% of all stars hang out. And that's because of the, the nuclear fusion practice which is happening inside those stars. We can understand how energy is being generated, how it flows, how the star becomes stable. And therefore, we can say to you, this star is giving us this much energy. And so when we see any of those stars, we know what their total luminosity is, and we therefore can calculate distance. Other standard candles, there's a, a class of star called a Cepheid variable, where it pulsates. And we can look at that star and go, gosh, it's going up and down in intensity in a very fixed amount of time. And that period is directly related to the total energy output of the star. And so and this is what we do at York University, in fact. We measure the variability of stars in time and say, ah, Therefore, it has to be this type of a star. Therefore, it's giving off this amount of energy, and we do the same distance calculation again. And so This works for the billions of light years away <laughs> as been detected by the Hubble telescope? The standard candle technique gets more complicated as you get further away, but the same basic idea applies, except now we use supernovae <laughs> as they blow themselves to bits because certain types of stars will give off a certain amount of energy as they die. We then can look at certain galaxies, and again, we can characterize them and say, Say there is a certain amount of energy. So there is what we call a distance ladder of these standard candles. And it all relies on our ability to interpret the physics, which is generating the energy in either the star or the star's death throw or what the galaxy is looking like. But the further away we go, the, the bigger the error bars are. And, the, and different sized stars. Comp yeah. The other quick question is... <laughs> I, 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 I promise to stay around afterwards so you can come and corner me. <laughs> All right. How can you tell the difference between a dip in luminosity due to a planetary transit and natural variation, whether it's random or periodic from some other process? 
the 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 glib answer is very carefully uh because and that that's why we've we've not released this data from the kepler's first year year and a half the follow-up observations are to do just that uh the the short answer is signatures when a star is is pulsing then uh, there is a very characteristic light curve that generates and it's smooth and continuous a transit tends to be a lot sharper. You're wandering along and all of a sudden with just the diameter of the planet, we go from this level down to this level. So there are distinct differences in the appearance of the light curve. The other thing is the um, uh, the orbital periods. Okay, if, if, if the same signature repeats 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days, then we have more confidence that it's a planet orbiting that object or at least there's an object it mightn't be a planet it could be a brown dwarf there could be other things compact objects things like neutron stars these complicate the observation so now we back that up with spectroscopic observations Uh, whereas as i said stars that are oscillating even the ones that are not as periodic as the cepheids or the ri lyris that I, i i mentioned here they tend to have smoother variations so the 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 more carefully you observe the variation in light from a star, the greater is the confidence that you can have in, yes, it's a planet, yes, it's a compact object, yes, it's the variability of the star itself. But you've got to collect a lot of data. You just don't go out and watch one cycle, and you look at it for as long a period of time as you possibly can. Thank you. Hi. What is the physical distribution in space of the planets we found, as in the closest and the furthest? And is there, a, uh, theoretically, a maximum limit beyond which you could never have a hope of, of, of finding it because of the instruments? At this point, uh, theoretically, a transit could be around a star that is at any distance from us because all we're looking at is the variation in light. Um, so the closest transit that I am aware of is about... 20, 25 light years. The furthest, hmm, I, I, don't quote me on this one, but I, th- I don't think we've seen a transit much further than a 1,000, 1,500 light years away. And, and part of that is, is what we call signal strength. You want to be very sure your signal to noise is, is good enough that you can say, yep, we've definitely dropped 1%. There's the edge going in there's the edge coming out and that means the object has to be reasonably bright because the telescope you're using is a finite size smaller the telescope kepler's telescope is less than a meter in diameter that that's not a big telescope so it limits the threshold of your light detectability and therefore the confidence you have in saying yep i've definitely seen a a transit so i think the range at the moment is is literally a couple of tens of light years out to maybe a thousand or two Radio velocities, same sort of problem. You're now breaking up the light from the star and spreading it out, which means you've got to have a big telescope to be able to collect enough light. The HARPS instrument that I mentioned that is down on the European Southern Observatory's telescope, it's on, a, it's on the back of a 3.6-meter telescope, and it can only see down to around about 14th, 15th magnitude with any confidence. So the main issue we have at the moment is the threshold of, of, of light collection bigger the telescopes you'll be able to see further away that's that's what we call aperture fever astronomers love big telescopes because you can see further away but if you're doing these sorts of observations you've got to get good strong signal and that's keeping us close the bigger the telescope the further away we'll be able to see so we are limited at the moment to probably a radius of only a few thousand light years from us for the techniques that I've mentioned to you. There are other techniques that we haven't mentioned, things like, for example, um, uh, oh, mental block, um, microlensing, whereby we're looking at the light from a distant object as an intermediate star or planet slides in front of us, and it creates a gravitational lens around it which can brighten the slight signature of that distant star and give us some insight into the planetary system because the planets can also help to lens and give us an increased signal. Theoretically, we can see those types of images out to tens of thousands of light years. And the one microlensing event that I can think of was out at a planet 9,000 light years. And some people are looking in other galaxies 
for that type of technique. So it depends which technique you're using. And over the next few years, as our technology improves, I think the, the distance boundaries will just blend away and disappear, which of course means there's even more data and my students are loving it. Yeah. Um, at some point, we're going to have X number of candidate planets. And you were talking about how you can use a, a spectrum minus spectrum kind of thing to determine what uh, sort of spectrum of light is reflecting off the planet passing yes. in front of it. What kind of information besides atmospheric uh, composition can you get out of that? Other than, well, you, first off, finding a planetary atmosphere that way is neat by itself. Uh, it, not only well, yeah. do you have, have a rock now, you've got a rock which is surrounded by an atmosphere, and that gives you some insight into whether it's a Jovian gas giant or whether or not it's a terrestrial planet like you know, Venus versus Jupiter. Uh, but once you see the atmosphere... If you've got, again, enough signal and enough resolution, you can begin to look for biomarkers. The presence, for example, of methane. Methane can have geologic uh, activity associated with it, or it can have life. Is it chemistry or, or is it biology that generates uh, that particular signature in a planetary atmosphere? Uh, that's what we're using to try and find water vapor. You know, Water vapor has some very distinct signatures in uh, an atmospheric spectrum. So looking at uh, an atmosphere from one of these planets and seeing water lines would be terrific. That would tell us that there's real water in the atmosphere. It doesn't tell us whether it's liquid, doesn't tell us whether it's solid, well, it does tell us that it's gas, at least. Uh, so you, you, you look for those sorts of signatures. But other biomarkers, if you look at our atmosphere, it's full of unfortunate <laughs> materials. And so if you find those types of signatures in another planetary atmosphere, it would certainly go a long way to saying that there is some level of industrial activity going on there. So you're looking for those types of signatures, but, of course, they're going to be relatively weak compared to for example, the water vapor line. But that's what we are beginning to look for. This is a very new technique. We've, we've only managed to see planetary atmospheres this way over the last three or four years. So you, know, you will see very rapid advancements in that uh, field very soon. And of course, NASA and other astronomical institutions are trying to put up spacecraft that will have enough resolution to actually image these planets. But we're still probably the better part of five to ten years away before we'll get anything like good resolution. Uh, once we start finding interesting terrestrial planets, say like ones with biomarkers, people are going to want to start giving them real names. So who's going, who's going to get to decide that? <laughs> the International Astronomical Union is the answer to that question, un undoubtedly. Uh, the IAU names all objects, even if they name them three, four, five, six, whatever, uh, they are the, the, the custodians, if you will, of all planetary designations. So be it in our solar system, naming the asteroids and the asteroid field, naming dwarf planets and so on, uh, they will be the ones that will construct the nomenclature that will go along with uh, uh, exoplanets. Uh, at the moment, they're confined to our solar system. Every crater, every mountain range, every dip mm -hmm. and valley and so on on Mars and Mercury and Europa and so, goes through the IAU. If we're looking for Earth-like planets, which are rocky planets in the habitable zone, and ultimately to see if there's life, why is it important to find a planet that's about the size of the Earth, or is it important? It's not necessarily critical. Where, When you have an object that is comparable in size to the Earth, then we can infer activity similar to our own planet. So, for example, the Moon is about a quarter of the size of the Earth, but the notion that it ever had life on it is you know, almost inconceivable because it solidified very quickly. To have life on a planet, we believe there should be a magnetic field that protects it from the harsh radiation, particulate radiation from a star. To have a magnetic field, you've got to have some sort of liquid interior. The moon cooled too quickly and solidified, and so there's no magnetic field around it. There are, of course, uh, size problems to keep an atmosphere, not enough gravitational field. So if you get an object too small, it just doesn't have enough of what we consider to be the physical characteristics that would allow life to stand any sort of chance to, to survive. 
When you go in the opposite direction, the problem is not quite so bad, but now you're talking about sort of an increased gravitational field on the planetary surface. Will life be able to develop in a much more intense gravity environment? Maybe, if you read science fiction, certainly. But the only thing that we have to work on here is the way the long chain molecules have developed on our planet. And so we've tended to stay in the realm of Earth 2 being comparable in size, both radius and mass, to our Earth to give a similar magnetic field to generate the possibility of an atmospheric envelope behaving somewhat similar to ourselves to have a magnetic field to protect it from the nearby stars, radiation, and so on. But certainly, if you found an object in the habitable zone that was twice the mass, twice the radius of the Earth, and so on, I, I'm pretty sure people would say that was an Earth-like planet. If they, they may reserve the notion of Earth, too, to be a much closer fit to ourselves. But from the point of view of searching for life, if you're in the habitable zone at two to three times the size of the Earth, that would be a darn good place to start looking. Absolutely. I, in the physics gossip, I have heard that the source of water on the Earth is from the asteroids that uh, hit the Earth. And they're being composed. They're composed of water, and given the long time and the Earth's cross section to capture this, this could happen in other uh, heavenly bodies. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, probably, absolutely true. The formation of water on our planet probably has two distinct sources, and it, it's a little unclear which one is the dominant. Depends which scientist you want to talk to. For the longest time, we thought outgassing was the principal mechanism that generated the oceans. That is to say, as the Earth cooled and the volatile material from within was being compressed and forced out to the surface to uh, envelop our planet, as it cooled, that atmosphere that was rich in water vapor began to condense and sort of it rained for oh, half a billion years or thereabouts and created oceans and the like. However, the, the, the theory associated with that over the last mm, 20 to 30 years has suggested that not nearly enough water could be formed from our interior to generate the level of water activity we see on our planet today. When we look at the asteroids, when we look at the cometary material, when we sort of backtrack to the early solar system and realize the level of bombardment that was taking place in the inner solar system by small objects courtesy of, of the Jovian gravitational field picking up whole masses of leftover planetesimal material and literally hurling it to the inner solar system, then we begin to realistically believe that the amount of water thus transported by these smaller objects was significant. We see that on the moon. One of the reasons we slammed Elcross into a crater by the name of Cabius last October is that the base of Cabius is forever in darkness. The way the moon's orbital inclination and rotation works, the base of Cabius is always dark. So if it generated a significant amount of ice in the early bombardment days of the solar system, it should still have been there. And in fact, it was. So the, the notion that there is lots of ice that is being transported to the inner solar system back three to four billion years ago is on very solid ground now. How much of the Earth's water came, if you will, in that fashion versus the outgassing? I haven't seen a definitive paper that says this percentage and this percentage. There's, there's a lot of waffling. But both sources played a significant role in the development of water on our planet three to four billion years ago. No question. One of the most astonishing things to me about our solar system is that our planets are more or less in a plane. You mentioned that there's at least one system that has six or seven planets that have that we have seen through transiting, uh, is or that we have detected. Have we detected them? Excuse me, through transiting, and just because we can see them through transiting, does that imply that they too are in a plane, or that they just they may have very different orbits that happen to transit the sun? that star. Okay, Gliese 581 is, is the six or seven planetary system that uh, you're referring to, and all of those planets have been found using radial velocity. So it doesn't tell us anything about their orbital inclinations. They, they could literally be all over the shop for all we know. There is one 
uh, transiting system where we have now found three. Okay, so that system seems to be well aligned. If our model of our solar system is correct, then stars form from what we call a solar nebula, which is a big three-dimensional cloud. It is set spinning courtesy of a supernova shock wave or a spiral density wave, but it's set spinning. And in the process of spinning and condensing, it collapses into, if you will, a very thickened pancake, which is why the planetesimal material, which is accreting and coalescing inside that nebula, end up forming planets that are more or less coplanar. If you look at the principal planets of our solar system, the asteroid belt, the, the Kuiper belt, and so on, most of the material is in a fairly thin range or a very small range of planetary inclinations. If that model is in fact correct, don't worry about things like planetary migrations and, and, and other dynamic activity within the solar system during its evolution, but just from its primordial origins, then it suggests to us that planetary systems will form in that thickened pancake around all stars. If that thickened pancake is towards us, great. If it's not, we don't see any of the transits. We don't have enough statistics yet to be able to answer your question categorically. As I said, Kepler found this triple transiting system just in August, and that's the only one where we've got more than one planet that we can see transiting. But the, the angle of transit, you know, the angle of inclination for the planes uh, for the planet's orbit has got to be within literally two or three degrees of our line of sight or the planet will miss the star entirely from our perspective uh, for example in our own solar system mercury and venus are able to transit in front of our own star but it doesn't happen very often and we're in our own solar system so you don't have to have the planetary orbit inclined very much to miss the star entirely so until we get more data that gives us a categorical determination about the planetary inclinations, we can't answer your question. But based upon our current understanding of planetary dynamics, we do really believe that all thickened pancakes from the solar nebula do contain the planets, but that that is a range of perhaps up to 10 degrees if you look at it from you know an angle on the side looking towards it. There can be as much as a variation of 10 degrees in that orbital inclination, and you only have to be a couple of degrees away before the transit technique misses uh, entirely and you just find the planets with radial velocity. Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. This event was hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, an educational charity promoting science, reason, secularism, and free inquiry. CFI Canada coordinates branches and campus groups across the country, runs a public education series, provides secular community services, incorporates cutting-edge multimedia such as blogs, podcasts, and YouTube, and is a regular voice in the press presenting a secular humanist, atheist, and skeptical perspective. Visit us at www.cficanada.ca and contact us at info at cficanada.ca.